So this is a different kind of talk for me. Uh, normally when I get up to do conference talks, they're, they're very technical. Um, there's lots of code and slides that you know, are really easy to explain because either the code compiles and it runs or it doesn't. Um, and the, in this one, it's, it's more anecdotal. Um, it's about my experience and the things that work for me. Uh, obviously, when it comes to anything to do with focus or the mind or the way it makes you work, it's, it's going to be subjective. It's going to be different from person to person. It's not always going to be the same for everybody. This is what works for me. Hopefully, some of it will work for you. Probably some of it won't. Um, but please do keep that in mind as you go through it, that this is not a, a guide to how to be 100% more focused all the time. Please don't take it away and go, I must never deviate from these rules and these guidelines, because that would be silly and it won't work. So um, I'm Aaron Bassett. Uh, I am a software engineer turned developer uh, advocate for a company called Nextmill. Uh, we are uh, over there slinging t-shirts at pretty much anybody who comes near us. Um, I'm not going to give you the sales pitch about who Nextmill is and what they do and all that kind of stuff. I have two colleagues out there who can do that if you're really interested. Uh, please go speak to them. Um, I do have a slide up there saying where I'm from because not only have they been lovely enough to pay for me to come here and give this talk and pay for me to give this talk in lots of different places, um, but they understand that this is an important conversation that needs to be had when technology is around mental health and they support me in the work that I do, which is really nice as well. So this is me. Yes, I was super cute. No, I have no idea what happened either. Um, I was about five, six years old here. Um, I had a pretty normal childhood. Um, a variation of normal. Uh, but I grew up in the 80s. And while the 80s had the best fashion and the best hair and the best shoulders, um, we didn't really have the best way of identifying mental health or developmental issues uh, whenever you were a kid. Um, so I uh, went untreated for 34 years uh, before I finally got diagnosed with ADHD. So I basically built my entire career. Um, I started more companies than I wish to admit, um, had more jobs and is probably healthy. Um, and really kind of fell into technology and developed myself while not knowing that I had this affliction. Um, in fact, nobody knew I had it when I was a kid either. I was just really loud and annoying. And I also had ADHD. Um, for people who don't know what ADHD is, uh, there's a little bit of science. Hopefully this is going to play a video with audio and not my Spotify playlist. If it does play my Spotify playlist, everybody's good with Taylor Swift, yeah? You can do it. Oh, go on, back one. Oh, no sound. Hold on. I came prepared for this eventuality. Go back one. Come on, let's go. Prefrontal cortex, PSC, is the cerebral cortex which covers the subfrontal part of the frontal lobe, the brain region that's been implicated in planning complex cognitive behaviours or personality expression, decision making and moderating social behaviour. The basic activity of the brain region is considered to be an orchestration of thoughts and actions in accordance with internal goals. The most typical psychological term for functions carried out by the prefrontal cortex area is executive function. Executive function relates to the abilities to differentiate among conflicting thoughts, determine good and bad, better and best, same and different, future consequences of current activities, working toward a defined goal, prediction of outcomes, expectations based on actions, and social control. That is, the ability to suppress urges that, if not suppressed, could lead to socially unacceptable outcomes. The frontal cortex supports concrete rule learning, while more anterior regions along the rostral caudal axis of the frontal cortex support rule learning at a higher level of abstraction. Okay, so all really technical stuff. Um, essentially what it means is that my prefrontal cortex is damaged. Uh, these images we have here um, are showing a difference in mass from a control brain in somebody who has ADHD. Uh, the front of it, where prefrontal cortex is, you should see like, a, like lots of kind of orangey stuff. That's showing the difference in mass. So essentially that part of my brain isn't developed the same way as a regular person's is. And for as you heard in that video, it's kind of important. Uh, things like the uh, impulse control um, or uh, perception of time is one um, or the ability to tell um, what is a good outcome, what's a bad outcome. You know, all these things that basically we rely upon 
to function in society um, don't work so well for me. In fact, it's, it's, it's quite uh, one of the things to turn up whenever I was doing research for this talk is uh, alcohol um, affects the prefrontal cortex in a very similar way. So whenever they talk about alcohol lowering your inhibitions, I'm pretty much just drunk all the time. And not because I'm Irish. Um, it's not all bad news all the time, though. It's, you know, it, <laughs> the good part about having a mental disorder is having a valid reason for all the stupid things we do because of a damaged prefrontal cortex. I would be lying if I've never went, oh, well, that was my ADHD. Sorry about that. Um, but it doesn't just affect your uh, ability, your impulse control, and your ability to, to work within a normal society. Um, it also affects this. So any biochemists recognize this at all? Oh, there we go. We've got one. Um, and it's dopamine. And if you didn't know what it was, you probably just had a nice hit of dopamine there. And I going, congratulations. Well done. It's your brain's way of reinforcing. Uh, it's your reward center, essentially. You know, any time you do something that your brain decides is something that is valuable, something that you should repeat, it's uh, you go to the gym, you get some dopamine. You take you know, off on your Jira tickets, you get some dopamine. You do anything that your brain goes, hey, this is going to help with your further survivability. You get some dopamine. If you have ADHD, you don't get no dopamine. Um, so unfortunately, we don't have the same reward structures in place, and we have a hard time telling what's good and bad, and you know, uh, differentiating between kind of what we should do and we shouldn't, and controlling our impulses, etc. And if you read any of these like how to be successful books, I've yet to come across one that goes, you know, top two rules for success: be flaky, don't manage your time properly. Be impulsive. You know, these are not things that are going to help you be successful in the ways in which society says that we should measure success. And success means different things to different people. Okay? For some people, success is all about those dollar dollar bills. I know it's a really old meme. I'm old, get over it. It's fine. You know, but for some other people, success might be you know, having power or influence within the workplace. Um, hopefully, for the majority of people, success might be that you're making a difference in the world. You know, it, it differs between person to person, but for the vast majority, you know, the way in which my brain works, I was not going to be able to achieve most of these things. Um, for me, really being successful is just not being bored. <laughs> um, so, a little kind of segue, a little story. Um, whenever you like started a new company, especially like tech companies and startups and stuff, they immediately deck you out in all this whack. You know, you get the hoodie and you get the T-shirt and you. T-shirt, um, you know, so, you, so you're a walking billboard from the moment that you start at the company. Uh, my friends used to joke that I would change um, jobs so often uh, because I didn't want to go clothes shopping. You know, as soon as the T-shirt started to look ratty, I would just go get another job rather than actually go shopping. That's how often I was switching companies and switching jobs. Um, I do need to specify because I think one of my colleagues in the audience um, next will give me two hoodies when I started. Good plan. <laughs> you doubled my longevity. Um, but no, for me, being successful was essentially that. It was making sure that I didn't get bored in the job. Um, one of my uh, colleagues described it as whenever you lose that engagement with what you're doing, um, trying to do any work is like nailing jello to the wall. You know, it becomes so difficult that the, the task is nigh impossible. You know, so you burn out, and you leave, and you go get another job, and it's not fulfilling in any way. And that's what I'm trying to, like, that's my measure for success, is I want to be engaged all the time. I need to be engaged all the time. I need a job that keeps me engaged, but I also need to moderate my own behavior in such a way that allows me to retain that engagement. And I read a book um, by a guy called Cal Newport. Sorry, I lie. I skimmed a book by a guy called Cal Newport because um, it's a technical book. And I've got ADHD. It's okay. Um, but one of the things that really stuck out to me, though, is this concept he has of uh, deep work. So for him, deep work is this equation. So you have work equals uh, time spent um, times intensity of focus. Yes, I know it spells like WTF. That's totally intentional. Um, <laughs> But if you look at this equation, okay, there, there is some things on there which are um, finite. You know, the, the time spent is finite. You have a finite amount of time that you can spend um, on any task or in any job. You know, so you can't really change that number. Okay, you can work 18 hour days if you like, but if your focus is still one, then your work is still 18. But if you manage to get your focus up to five and you work four hours, suddenly your work's at 20. 
You know, so really focus is the thing that we, we need to be modifying here. We can't really modify time to a big degree. Um, and we want to ensure that we're engaged so we're producing this high quality work. So we need to modify our focus. Now, one of the, the things I dislike about the term ADHD or attention deficit hyperactive disorder is there is no way I have a deficit of attention. If anything, I've got way too much attention for everything that's going on at all times. Um, like, as, as probably some people may know, uh, the treatment for ADHD in adults is amphetamines. They give me stimulants to slow me down. You know, and it, it seems counterproductive at first. You know, why would you give somebody whose brain's going 100 miles an hour a stimulant? It's because it allows your brain to, your chemical stimulation allows your brain then to take in a smaller amount of external stimulus. So I see allows you to focus on things externally because your brain is getting the stimulus it needs chemically. You know, so we actually have so much focus and just really difficult in directing it. You know, we can either direct it towards work or we can spend eight hours writing the most well-researched Reddit comment there ever has been, which I definitely have not done when there's a deadline. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's more about directing that focus and ensuring that we are setting ourselves up to, to produce our best work and to give us ourselves the opportunity to have that level of focus. Now, there's one other thing that I want to kind of mention uh, before you enter some of the, the ways in which you're doing that is this uh, analogy of spoons. Um, you may have heard of it before. It's normally talked about when it comes to uh, people with chronic pain um, is that your willpower is essentially a bunch of spoons. And every time that you do something, it costs you a spoon. So if you, you get 12 spoons for the day. It might seem like a lot, but getting out of bed, there's a spoon. Having a shower, that's a spoon. You know, going to work, there's another spoon. You know, all, everything that we have is a finite number of spoons. And that's the same for, for ADHD as it is for some of your chronic pain. You know, we don't have that same reward system, that same dopamine kick. So pretty much everything that you do is, is willpower based. You know, you've really got to force yourself to do it. And if you're spending those spoons in the wrong areas, well, they're gone, you don't get them back. You know, even sometimes you can borrow spoons from the, the, the next day. Um, but you, you always have to, to like settle your books at the end of the time. And you, all you're doing is setting yourself up for a bad day the next day. And it's the same with creativity as well. It's not something that you can just turn on all the time like a faucet. You know, if you try to force it, you're burning spoons. You're using up your willpower. Sometimes, yes, you can sit down and you can focus and it's great and it just flows and it's fantastic. Other times it's not going to happen. I'm sorry, it's just not. You know, the well is dry. Do not try and force it. You're just using up spoons. You know, get up, go do something else. Go walk the dog, go read a book, have a shower. I don't care. Just don't sit there and try to tap a dry well. It's not going to work. And in fact, what happens instead is um, this idea of what they call shallow work. We become so fixated on this idea that we need to be productive all the time, all the time, constantly, that we create work for ourselves. And we don't have the focus or the concentration for deep work. So instead, we conduct shallow work. And shallow work can be, you know, you write that email, you send that memo, you schedule that bloody meeting. You know, all these things that to all your colleagues and to yourself look as if you're being productive. But you're not. You're just spinning your wheels. You're burning time. You're not actually producing anything. You're not uh, bettering the company in any way. In fact, you're probably being a detriment because you are bothering your colleagues. You are scheduling meetings or you're sending useless emails marked urgent, please pick your lunch for Wednesday, seriously? Um, you know, it's, it's these kind of things that then become fixated upon because we have this idea that we need to be seen to be productive all the time. In fact, as this tweet, um, and this guy, is, he's not a nobody, Nathan Hubbard, um, he, I think it was uh, one of the directors at Twitter, you know, this is, this is somebody who has clout, um, and he says that whatever your hustle, this is, sorry, this is a Christmas, you know, the time when you're probably most likely to take a break. And he's saying, whatever you're hustling for, take note. Most people, companies are shut down until, the eight, until 18, so the, until the next year after Christmas. That means you get two extra weeks to outwork your competition. That's 3.8% more time for, for perspective. You see in Bolt, one is gold medals running 1.2% faster. These two weeks are a gift to get to work. Holy shit. <laughs> you can't take Christmas off? Like, come on, seriously, how productive are you going to be? There's nobody else there. You know, take a break, take some time off. 
relax, it's okay. You're not gonna be productive all the time. Once you internalize that and you actually realize that, hey, I can probably get just as much work done if I don't sit in front of my computer for 12 hours. Um, you, you'll surprise yourself with just how easier it is then when you do sit down to actually get into that flow state. Thankfully, not everybody um, has the same kind of uh, mentality. This is Jason Fried. He's one of the co-founders of Basecamp. And I love this quote. It's, workaholics aren't heroes. They don't save the day. They just use it up. And that, that really resonates with me. Like, I don't know how many people um, have just sat in the office just to be in the office. Uh, I used to work for a company where um, I was doing a two-hour commute each way for absolutely no freaking reason. We totally could have been remote. It would have been fine. Um, and it was burning me out, 100% burning me out. And we were running behind in some of our projects, but I felt that if I wasn't there, that I, then I wasn't contributing. In fact, I came into work one day and I sat, and this is no exaggeration, <laughs> for eight hours and watched that. <laughs> I did not stop for lunch. I did not get up to go get a drink. I did nothing. I sat and I stared at my prompt flicker at me for eight hours because I was so burned out that I couldn't even form a sentence. I, by the time I thought about what I needed to do and tried to get the signals through my fingers to type it out, it was gone because I was so burned out. But I thought that if I wasn't there, if I wasn't sitting in that particular seat at that particular time, that I was letting the team down. Actually, I was letting the team down by being there because if I wasn't there, then they would have adjusted the burn down charts and it wouldn't have looked quite so unproductive. But no, I, I would be so conditioned that I had to look productive that just being sat in the seat was where I thought I needed to be. And that's, that's, not, that's not success. You know, that's, I'm not bettering the company by doing that. I'm not bettering myself by doing that. I'm not freaking enjoying it. That's for bloody sure. But it's this idea of like the shallow work versus deep work. You know, so deep work is hard. It's really hard to get into that flow state. It's difficult. So we default to this shallow work. We default to this perception that if we're there, if we're being vocal and loud and sending emails and tweets and scheduling meetings, that that's enough. So how do we get into this flow state? How do we manage our tasks to ensure that we're setting ourselves up the best way? So there's loads of different things. And loads of different techniques. Like Pomodoro. Um, for anybody who hasn't heard of this, this is a technique where you essentially set a kitchen timer or any kind of timer uh, for normally 15 or 25 minutes. Um, and you work solidly for that time, knowing that at the end of your 15, 25 minutes, you get a five minute break and then you start a new session. So you're basically building in interruptions? What? <laughs> this just does not work for me at all. I'm barely even trying to remember what it is that I'm working on by the end of the first 15 minutes. And then suddenly I get a ding and my distra I'm distracted and I'm off doing something else. Um, then you have, oh, this is probably one of the most famous ones, um, you know, the uh, get things done, which is this entire flow chart of like, you know, an action comes in, is it actionable straight away? You know, is it, does it need to be delegated? Is it this and that and the other? And yeah, okay, some of it's, some bits are really good. I love the can you do it in two minutes. That rule I've adopted personally for myself. If it's something that I can do in two minutes right now, do it, because otherwise I will forget. Um, and I don't really follow an awful lot of the rest of it, because there's, there's too much to remember to do, to be honest. And then you have, um, so this, these ones are uh, bullet journals. Bullet journals, they're not task management lists. They are an art form. Like, seriously, look at some of this stuff. Like, this is beautiful. It's so color-coded and so nice, and it looks like, when did they get anything else done? <laughs> By the time they've picked out what their color codes are going to be and how they're going to decorate it and stuff, do they actually do any work? You know, it, they look fantastic though, don't they? <laughs> Again, not really going to work for me. Um, I do have to admit, whenever I was researching this and I came across the fact that, okay, it's, it's not cool to call them bullet journals anymore. Apparently they're bujos. You know, like fucking like JLo or like Kimye. You know, we can't just call it a bullet journal. They've got to shorten it now as well. It's got to have like this hip little brat. No, no thank you. And um, then you've got Eat the Frog. Um, so Eat the Frog is you pick your worst task of the day and you do it first. The idea being that is if you start your day by eating a frog, there's nothing worse that can happen. Um, yeah, it kind of works. Um, unfortunately, I'm not really normally at my most productive first thing in the day. So I probably don't want to be tackling my most challenging tasks then, but hey, if it works for you, it works for you. In fact, most of these things don't work for me because I have ADHD. Um, and people with ADHD 
weirdly have a problem of organization. I love the end of this quote here. Organization becomes an unsustainable task because organizational systems work on linearity, importance, and time. And hey, uh, remember that whole slide about it's not my fault, I've got a damaged brain? Totally not my fault, I've got a damaged brain. You know, I, to do systems don't work. These, these work, they're good, because they're visual. I can see them, they're there. Um, unfortunately, I spend about 75% of my time on the road. Um, so they're still there, stuck on my monitor at home. Uh, but doesn't really help very much. So what does help? You know, I've gone through all this stuff that's, that doesn't work, so what does? Your working environment for me is probably the most important thing. Um, for people who don't recognize it, in the background of that uh, slide is Facebook. Uh, so that's Facebook's actual like offices. It's a, the whole thing, the whole place is open plan. Apparently even Zuckerberg, when he's not being interviewed by the American government, um, has a desk there. Um, and that just, I, I'm, I'm getting anxiety even just thinking about working. Look at it. How noisy must that be? There's so much distraction there. Like, I can barely continue to talk because I know there's so much busyness behind me. Um, and it's like these open plan offices that are so cool at the minute, they, <laughs> they don't really work for anybody. This is a great uh, quote here from BT Futurologist. BT, for people who don't know, is British Telecom. Um, it's a company in the UK um, that was built with public money and is now private. Uh, but basically, the trouble with uh, open plan offices is they're a one size fits all model which actually fits nobody. And they're not hip and they're not cool and they're not new. In fact, they've been around for a, a very long time and we've done a lot of research into them. Steelcase interviewed a thousand uh, different office workers, 95% um, of which thought that uh, having a, like, some privacy was important. 41% um, felt they actually had privacy. 31% felt they had to leave work to get anything done. Like, does that not seem incredibly stupid? Like, you're building this office for people to come to do work, and nearly a third of your workforce has to leave to actually do anything. You know, um, they lost an average of 86 minutes a day to distractions for being an open plan office. So if you average that out, like, over a year, that is 10 working weeks per year. You know, who couldn't do with another 10 weeks for an annual leave? I know I could. You know, but that's the amount of time that we're losing. We're like two and a half months from those little distractions that happen all the time for me in open plan office. Canada Life find that uh, people in open plan offices take 70% more sick days. You know, we all know that person who, because again, it's shallow work and we all have to be seen to be productive. They come into the office when they've got a cold or a flu and they share it with everybody. You know, in fact, you don't even need to have that many people in the office for your chances increase. If once you have a second person in, your uh, chances of, getting, uh, of taking sick days increase by 50%, just with two people. Queensland University of Technology's Institute of Health and Biomedical Innovation um, find that people in uh, open plan offices uh, have a 90% chance of having higher levels of stress, conflict, and high blood pressure. You know, this is actually making us ill, physically ill. Uh, Cornell University, did a, uh, a experiment where they exposed people to three hours of noise, recorded noise, from, from an open plan office. Didn't actually put them in an office, just played the, the background noise to them. And what they found was just over that three hours that the amount of, I'm gonna get the pronunciation wrong here, uh, ep 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 adrenaline um, is what is more commonly known as, um, increased in three hours just by being exposed to the noise. And one of the really interesting parts was the, anybody who was taking part in the survey was 50% less likely to make ergonomic adjustments to their seating arrangements. So they were so distracted and so distressed just by the noise of being in an open plan environment that they didn't even notice their own physical discomfort. So <laughs> they were actually working in like, not only in a mental headspace that was bad for them, but it's actually impacting on them physically as well. And this is not something that is new. Open plan offices are not a new invention. This is 1896, open plan office. That is the counting room in uh, Cambridge. 1900, the long room government life insurance HQ in Wellington, US. 1902, um, Harwood, Maine, Sherman, architecture and interior design. These are all open plan offices that are over 100 years old. You know, have we not learned yet? <laughs> Probably the only good open plan office ever has been was 1939, um, where Frank Lloyd Wright developed uh, this masterpiece. Now, um, it was called a cathedral of work, 
it's supposed to look like a forest. It's got lots of open light. Um, yes, it is open plan, but you can see the amount of space for each desk. Each desk itself was individually designed to best maximize the space while still allowing um, mingling between different departments. But unfortunately, while Frank Lloyd Wright got it incredibly right, people started copying it. And whenever you get these cheap knockoffs, they're not normally as good as the original. So then in 1968, Henry Miller came up with this term called the Action Office. And that, it's probably closer to what we'd all have probably experienced in our offices today. And it took um, actually a German idea called the, the Organic Office. Um, and they, so the Organic Office was this idea of still having open plan, but having more kind of fluidity to the way in which it was organized. You could um, you know, have breakout areas mixed in with meeting areas, mixed in with desks. And Henry Miller did, developed this range of essentially furniture that you could chop and change depending on what you needed at the time. And this is pretty much what like, every IKEA office um, has from now on. And it, it gives you some privacy. You know, you have, obviously, we don't want to go back to cubicle farms, but you do have these little desks, et cetera. And it is somewhat better. Um, you know, they're everywhere. And, but even Nexmo, so where I work, um, you know, we've got this, this lovely new office that's been designed in London. Um, it has this staircase thing. Um, it has lovely little cubicles that you can go and hide in. And they have uh, the scrum areas have got sound dampening uh, curtains. You know, they really have felt or thought about how they can minimize distraction. And then they have an open plan office for engineers. You know, even while a lot of thought has gone into it, even we don't get it right. And that's why this is my favorite office. You know, this, this is, I can completely control here. Okay, yes, I don't get like ping pong tournaments and I don't have like a fridge full of like free soft drinks or whatever, but I control every aspect of what's on this desk. You know, from uh, the fact that I have a second uh, computer that's playing um, Aro, I think that is. Yes, Aro. So uh, my ADHD part of my brain is like a small child sometimes. You know, it's just constantly asking questions and just wanting additional input and stuff. So like any good parent, um, I just plunk it down in Netflix and ignore it um, while I try to actually get my work done. So the, for me, these really trashy TV shows is just the right amount of stimulus without actually being distracting. Um, and trying to do that in an open plan office is probably not going to go over too well. Um, maybe somebody might be a different episode and I'm ruining the end for them, who knows. Um, but also, it, I get to control everything. If it's, if it's too hot, I open a window. If it's too cold, I turn up the heating. You know, if I want to run around in my dressing gown um, and my zombie slippers, I can. It doesn't matter. I control the entire environment. I can remove any external uh, blockages that I have to allow me to get focused on flow. And that's the only thing that is important. So then we have routine. You know, so once we've got our environment sorted, we need to have some form of routine to, to allow us to get in the slow state. So this is, this is my ultimate routine. So I get up early. Um, I do some work. Um, around 8 a.m., everybody else is kind of getting up and there's traffic noise as people go to work and stuff like that. Too distracting, I stop. I read a book, I do something else. Um, then kind of 10 a.m. to 3 p.m., I'm working again. Um, by that time, my focus is pretty much done for the day. So I'm, you know, I'm going to go to the gym, I'm going to do some like, free time to relax, whatever. You know, it's, it's really geared around when I know I'm productive. Because again, we don't want to be trying to force it. You know, we don't want to be, we're not going to get that dopamine kick, you know, from uh, completing a task. There's no, like, you rock kind of thing coming in here. We only have a certain amount of spoons, you know. <laughs> How many analogies can I fit in here? Um, we can just turn on that crea creativity faucet anytime we want. You know, so we have to try and skip, create a routine that works for us as an individual. And that's really difficult to do unless you control your environment, um, which is pretty much impossible to do unless you're working from home or a co-working space or wherever else. It doesn't always work for me. Uh, this, is, this is my travel so far this year. Um, we're only in freaking April. Um, so as much as I want to kind of stick to this, I don't always get to, but we try our best. Um, but normally when talking to people about this, you go, well, that's, that's all well and good. Yes, you know, everybody wants to work remotely and everybody wants to sit at home and work from their pajamas and you know, have a 30 second commute from the bedroom. But how are we gonna know that our staff are actually working? You know, every, every time I speak about this, managers are always asking, but how are we going to know that they're, they're working? And it's like, well, 
that's not your job, to be honest. Your job as a manager is not to make sure the bums are in seats. If that's all you're there for, get a freaking clock in clock. You know, <laughs> a manager's job is, is to remove obstacles to ensure that their team can do their best work. And if that means that they need to uh, work remotely or that they um, need, well, <laughs> there's, there's kind of three things that come into this. So the, the really simple ones is uh, best equipment. Everybody always talks about that, you know, as if it's some miraculous thing. You know, come to our company and you'll get a new MacBook. That's like saying, yes, come be a fireman and we'll give you hoses. Like, come on, it's basic freaking equipment. Of course I'm gonna to expect to get like a new freaking MacBook when I start a company or whatever else I need to do my job. Whenever you think of the cost, the, the actual cost of having a human resource um, sitting doing work, it, that is a huge cost. Um, a new MacBook or whatever else they need, if it's like if they want a mechanical keyboard or they want a number monitor or they want whatever, those are minimal compared to the cost of actually having a person sitting there doing work. So why would you nickel and dime over that kind of stuff? Yes, give them the equipment that they need. Then you've got other kind of ones which maybe are a little bit harder to manage. You know, how do you as a manager manage up to ensure that your team are having the support they require or that you're removing any obstacles? Um, I worked for uh, an ed tech company actually um, a few years ago before I started Nexmo. And um, our CEO um, used to phone the developers like their actual like, phones on their workstations. Um, and put in feature requests, completely skipping the entire process that we had um, for doing our product lifecycle. And no matter how much we, like, I asked them, and I asked them, and I asked them, you know, please don't do this. You know, these developers have their own tasks. You know, all you're doing is, you know, interrupting their current work, and we have no way of measuring what our actual productivity is, etc., because none of this stuff is getting recorded. He was CEO, he didn't care. You know, it's just like, yeah, they're my, they're my engineers. I'm going to phone them if I want to phone them. So I could have continued to bash my head against that wall and, and fought with them over it. But instead, I, I spoke to the engineers, and I asked them. I was like, okay, so do you phone other departments? And they were like, no, we, we walk down the stairs and speak to them. I was like, okay, do your partners or significant others phone you at work? And they're like, no, we've got mobile phones. They, they phone our mobiles. I was like, do you use the phone for anything at all when you're at work? And they're like, yes we get these really annoying calls from the CEO. So I went and I got a big ass box and I unplugged every phone from every developer's desk. I put it in the box and I left it outside of our infrastructure team. They didn't use it for anything else. All it was was a distraction. Distraction gone. You know, sometimes that's what you need to be doing as a manager. Not making sure that somebody is sat in a seat from nine to five. You know, because what they might be doing is just sitting staring at that blinking bloody cursor. You know, you need to be ensuring that what you're actually doing is giving them the best opportunity possible to produce their best work to get into this flow state. Um, and sometimes it's, it's even things that you don't really even understand or, or even can expect yourself. I had a, um, one of our developers who, um, their productivity just absolutely nosedived. No reason whatsoever that we could see. You know, nothing had changed in the actual company itself. Um, I knew he'd had a kid like a while back, maybe a year or so ago. Um, and I could have just you know, pulled him up, did the usual kind of disciplinary type stuff. But instead, we went, we, we had a coffee, we talked about just life in general. And it turned out that his wife returned to work, um, and the shifts that she'd been promised uh, were different. So what actually ended up was their childcare costs were twice what they'd budgeted for. And this was stressing him out. You know, because they'd budgeted a certain amount for childcare, and this is why his wife is going to buy for these hours. So it was, well, change your times you work then. You know, um, so you need to pay for childcare on a Friday, don't work a Friday. Come in two hours extra every day. You know, do what you need to do to work this around. And suddenly, yes, okay, I probably was getting maybe, you know, an hour less or two hours less per, like, from him per week because he was looking after his kids. But his productivity went from being negligible to being really high again. You know, and it's those kind of things you've got to look out for. The next question I always get about remote teams is, how do you communicate, you know? If I can't just like walk over and uh, tap you on the shoulder where you've got your headphones on, um, how am I going to talk to you, <laughs> you know? How am I going to interrupt your work? Um, so our team, we're fully remote. Like, uh, so this is where we normally are, I think. Most of us are in kind of GMT or BST as it is now. We have a few in the US, they're, they're a few hours behind. Um, this was 
uh, like a month ago while we were at some different conferences. So it was only an old chops and changes. And then like three days after that, it chopped and changed again. You know, so <laughs> um, it's not something that we can really plan for an awful lot. Um, so we use Slack. And as you can see, our conversations are always uh, incredibly professional. Uh, yeah, mac and cheese is serious business. Amanda will fight you if you don't uh, believe that. But yeah, so, and most people think of Slack as being uh, synchronous, not asynchronous. You know, it's, it's a chat, it's, it's real time chat. But you, there's lots of tools you can use. We use like Geekbot for doing our daily stand ups. Um, yeah, it's not, it, the whole like, great, have a nice day after the crippling self doubt was a little bit patronizing. Thanks, Geekbot. Um, but over now, it's generally a pretty good tool. It keeps us kind of updated on, on what our colleagues and things are doing. Um, uh, even sometimes we will do it whenever we're not actually working and stuff. Because we're a remote team, we don't have that water cooler to talk around. This is our way of keeping everybody updated. And as well as kind of those, we, we use rooms a lot. So, oops. You know, so, play this time. There we go. Yeah. So we create rooms for pretty much anything, or channels, as they're called in Slack. Um, and that way, you don't need to be in a channel all the time. But if there's a, you know, we're talking about a product, or a, we're talking about um, a event, or we're talking about pretty much anything, then we create a channel. And that means that people who are interested can dip in and out of that channel as required and get caught up in everything that's being mentioned. You know, we have lots, lots, lots of channels. Um, OK, so this is all great. This is all like stuff that, you know, and the, the best will in the world is not always going to, to work. You know, no matter how much prior planning we have, um, sometimes the excrement is going to meet the oscillation. You know, we're going to have crunch time. Um, you can't keep your routine. You're going to have to turn that faucet on whether the well is uh, dry or not. At least that's what people think. So this, this, uh, this is a, like your productivity over a 40 hour week. Okay? So let's say we increase that to a 60 hour week. You know, so your productivity should essentially increase by 50%. You know, you're adding an extra 20 hours per week on there. And it does, as you can see from the graph, for the first few weeks. And then you start to burn out. And you get tired. And your productivity drops off. So this is your error rate normally. Um, so for every 1,000 lines of code, um, estimate you write between 15 and 50 bugs. Now, I did a lot of research into kind of how uh, people's error rates increase depending upon how fatigued that they are. Um, and there's two industries where this is incredibly important, and they've done a lot of studies into it. And that's the military, because we don't want to be dropping bombs in the wrong place just because we haven't had a good nap. Um, and uh, doctors and surgeons. You know, they're on their feet, they're tired a lot of the time, and they don't want to be making mistakes. So they've done a lot of research into kind of your error rates. So this is our, this is our standard amount of errors that we're producing uh, per week on a 40-hour week. This is what we actually start to produce once we start to become fatigued. You know, so you can see our error rate is, a, is a higher straight away. It does peter off towards the end. The only reason it peters off towards the end is because we're not writing as much code. You know, writing less code, we're producing less bugs. But it's still a lot higher. So let's say that each error then you know, adds an additional couple of hours onto the work we have to do. So this is our new productivity level, once you've taken that into account. And let's be honest, if it's crunch time, as well as writing errors, you know, you're probably introducing lots of technical debt. You know, there's a little quick hack that will be fixed next week. And it's the commit log says it was written in 2014. You know, that kind of stuff. So you've got all this technical debt you're introducing. You're probably not writing a test, let's be honest. You're going to have to go free and you're going to have to increase uh, your test coverage again. So let's drop your productivity down a little bit more. And you're probably not writing any docs as well. So whenever you come back to look at any of this stuff later on, again, your productivity is going to dip. So let's take that back down. And suddenly that four week lead that we had is now just over a week. So that's great then. So we'll do crunch time for a week. And then we'll take a couple of days off and do crunch time for a week. No, your recovery time is two to three times longer than your actual crunch period. So if you do crunch for a week, you're going to need at least two to three weeks recovery time before you can start running that again. Because it's you know, that whole faucet thing and the spoons thing. You know, you've got to pay that back at some point. So the other thing people say, think is, let's just more developers then. You know, we, let's not fix our environments. Let's not get them the right tools. Let's just put more bums in seats. And this is normally the graph that they bring out. You know, see this? hockey stick. 
you know, you have this dip at the start as new people join the team as you onboard them and get them up to speed, et cetera. And then suddenly the spike of productivity as they, uh, as they immediately ramp up to 100% productive. And that never works. Because if you're introducing new people to a team, especially during crunch time, nobody's got time to actually properly onboard them. So you get something like this. So the team productivity dips. It starts to recover ever so slightly, but the project managers are in a panic because we're actually performing worse than we were like two weeks ago. So they add more people and your productivity dips even more. And then you slowly start to climb back up until about week 11, week 12, when one of the guys, probably the person who's been on the team longest, um, just has enough. And he has this heroic effort to try and get things back on track. And you've got this massive spike in productivity until they burn out and go off on sick leave. Um, and then suddenly you've got nobody leaving the team and your productivity is down here somewhere. And maybe if you're very, very lucky, you know, three, four months down the line, you get back to nearly what you were at the start. You know, there is no shortcuts in any of this stuff. Really, for any of this, um, it all boils down to, as I said, making sure that you personally, because all this is subjective, this is what works for me, you know, um, are setting your own standards for how you should be focusing on things, the environment that you need to focus on things. And if you're managing people, then your most important task is making sure that you're enabling them to, to have that control over their environment, over their workplace, over the way in which they work, that they can find the things that work for them because all our brains are different. Um, some are ADHD, others are not, um, but of their own quirks, shall we say. Um, and you're never gonna find a balance that works for everybody. So in what is essentially creative industries, we need to have that autonomy, that control over what we do in order to, to kind of reach our maximum potential. So that's everything I've got to say. Um, that's my Twitter handle at the top. That's my company handle at the bottom. Um, as I said, I'm not gonna give you the speed. Go speak to the people on the stand. They'll, they'll give, I'll be there as well, giving it to. Um, however, I do wanna say again, just hi. Uh, glad or how supported I feel working on that team. Um, they're a great bunch of folks. They allow me to come do stuff like this and they uh, support my uh, ADHD brain really, really well. So um, I just want to uh, pick up them one more time. Um, and that's it. I don't think I've got time for questions, but as I said, I will be on the booth. So please, if you've got anything you want to say or any feedback or um, want to talk to me about the process for getting diagnosed with ADHD, um, yeah, I'm more than happy to talk about any of that. Thank you very much.